Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As per the time zone you are in, first I would like to welcome all the attendees here tonight and to thank John Gerhardt Center for giving me the chance to moderate this session, the first session in the spring season of series. It's without a doubt a great honor to be introducing such an influential figure. I am personally very excited and honored to be part of the session. One of the most renowned people in the world of public health and social inequality, Professor Emeritus Richard Wilkinson, a social epidemiologist, author, and advocate. Professor Wilkinson is one of the two brilliant editors of the social determinants of health. I had the honor uh, earlier to facilitate or to moderate a session for uh, Professor Mormo as well. His literary work has inspired two documentaries, the Great Leveler, which coincide with the publication of his Unhealthy Societies, and another called The Divide, based on his book, The Spirit Level, released on, uh, in 2009, translated into 24 language, and it's considered a bestseller to, the, to this day. Honestly, I didn't read it yet. I will do. It's on my very common to-do list for sure, because the reviews are amazing. It's very inspiring and actually overwhelming. Over the past few years alone, he has delivered hundreds of conference addresses, speeches, and interviews around the world, including the EU, WHO, World Bank, OECD, and TED, consequently inspired, inspiring millions. Me being one of them with his brilliant shift of focus toward economic inequality, rather than the traditional measures, including GNP, uh, GMP and GDP, because from a country where, where the nail polish can feed a whole family for a month, literally, we feel this. the GDP is not the only indicator that we should consider. Professor Wilkinson has a one-of-a-kind background and an astonishing history of achievements. I don't think we will ever have enough time to mention it all, but to name a few, Professor Wilkinson has originally studied economic history and philosophy of science at London School of Economics before training in epidemiology. His work is focused on social class differences in death rate, having played an integral role in international research on social determinants of health and on the societal effect of income uh, inequality. Professor Wilkinson is a professor emeritus of social epidemiology of the University of Nottingham Medical School and honorary professor at the University College of London and visiting professor at the University of York. He also co-founded the Equality Trust, a registered charity since 2007. He received a Solidar Silver Rose Award and was also awarded a Community Access Unlimited Humanitarian of the Year Award. I can go forever, but I think there will be no time for Professor Wilkinson to speak. So without further ado, uh, allow me the privilege to introduce Professor Richard Wilkinson here with us uh, from the platform of John Gerhardt Center in the American University in Cairo, Egypt, a land with a rich past but unfortunately burdened with inequality, seeking salvation through reaching economic equality. Please allow me to welcome Professor Richard Gerald Wilkinson. The mic is you, sir, and thank you for allowing us and giving us this chance. We are so lucky. Dina, thank you very much for that um, generous introduction. Um, I, I feel embarrassed by it because talking about inequality um, it, it, it sounds, um, well, it doesn't really fit, but uh, I, I do subscribe to the view that uh, what matters is being in the right place at the right time. And I was one of the first people trained in epidemiology who had not done medicine first. I came, came into epidemiology from the social sciences. And that suddenly means you ask different questions uh, and you um, and look at different uh, health from a different angle. Uh, and so that is, is really my background. That's what makes the difference. Um, but anyway, I'm going to share some slides with you um, and take you through um, a, a really a long period of my work. Um, I've been working on the effects of inequality for 
I don't know, 45 years or something like that from the mid 1970s. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, what I want to start with is really to point out that um, the common view of inequality uh, it's an extremely naive view. It's basically the idea that inequality only matters if it creates poverty or if people think it's terribly unfair. But actually, a more accurate view of the effects of inequality is it uh, has to do with our evolved psychology of dominance and subordination, superiority and inferiority. It affects social relationships, how we treat each other. Um, it increases status competition. Um, it makes class and status more important. All sorts of things like that, that I'll take you through, uh, which I think economists by and large had not understood at all. Um, so our work was rather a, a, a breakthrough. Basically what I'm going to show you is this graph over and over again. Um, I found it on um, uh, web, uh, on um, what's his name, uh, images, Microsoft's images. And uh, I, I said, at last, somebody has understood 40 years of my work. This is basically um, uh, a shorter way of, of saying what I've done. <laughs> I'll show you different problems up the side. Uh, income inequality along the bottom, the more unequal societies on the right and the more uh, equal ones on the left. Um, so expect to see that graph again and again in different forms. Um, uh, one of the things we did early on after getting out figures from uh, the UN Human Development Report and the World Bank on uh, income inequality between within countries. Um, we looked at uh, those figures on income inequality uh, in relation to a great range of outcomes where uh, other organizations had uh, put together reliable figures. So the WHO has figures on life expectancy, OECD on maths, children's maths and literacy scores. Um, and uh, all these things you see listed there, um, we just downloaded data from respected international organizations. And what this graph is showing is if you put all those things into one uh, index, which we've called the index of health and social problems, um, you see the more unequal countries on the right doing worse. We were looking at the rich developed market democracies. Um, where we can get these uh, highly comparable figures uh, that allow us to compare uh, different countries. Um, <clears throat> and you see the USA, Portugal, UK um, uh, having worse outcomes on this index. Basically, you know, the USA has the highest homicide rates. It has one of the poorest life expectancy figures in the, amongst the rich developed countries has more people in prison, it has higher obesity. So basically all these things go wrong in more unequal countries. And in the more equal ones on the left, uh, the Scandinavian countries, and when we were doing this analysis, uh, Japan as well, uh, do, do well on all those things. Um, so uh, I'm gonna take you through some of the individual components of that index, um, but first, uh, we were worried that people would think we just selected problems to, um, to suit our argument. So we also looked at another index, the UNICEF Index of Child Wellbeing. It was compiled from about 40 different components to measure child well-being specifically in rich countries. Um, in this graph, doing worse is lower down. In the last one, um, uh, worse scores uh, were higher. So that's why this has a, a negative slope rather than a positive slope. But basically it's showing you exactly the same thing. More unequal countries, child well-being is lower. Uh, the index includes things like whether, whether there's bullying in school, 
um, how what proportion of children are immunized um, can children talk to their parents uh, what are their maths and literacy scores like um, uh, all sorts of measures of that kind um, so it's it's in a way it's a child version of this graph uh, only difference is whether worse scores are higher or lower um, and to bring us up to date because some of this data is fairly old um, there have been a number of analyses of um, uh, COVID mortality and uh, incidence, infection rates and so on, showing again that more unequal countries have suffered worse from, from COVID. Um, there have been a number of uh, new analyses from other people. Uh, this is using one of those uh, lost wallets experiments that psychologists do. Uh, wallets are, are left around as if lost in, in different places and um, the study is to see whether they're handed in or not. And uh, you see here in the more unequal countries, um, only about 20% are returned and in the more equal countries, about 80% are returned. Very big differences. And that's true of a lot of the outcomes we're looking at. Uh, it's not just a five or ten percent difference. It's it's a twofold difference or five or even tenfold difference between the more uh, more and less equal countries. Um, and our data, as I said, is is nearly always the rich developed market democracies. This analysis from someone else includes uh, 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 middle income uh, countries as well. Um, imprisonment. Um, notice it's a log scale up the side, uh, makes it harder to judge the intervening points. But Japan at the left there is about 40 prisoners per 100,000. The USA, you see, is over 400. So you've got a tenfold difference there in the proportion of the population locked up. Really expensive. Um, when we were doing this analysis, we uh, noticed a paper that said that some American states uh, spend more on um, imprisonment than on higher education. An absolutely astonishing um, reflection on, on uh, what, what, what can go wrong with the society. I may say all this analysis I've been showing you, we repeated on the 50 American states. We wanted to have a separate test bed to see whether things that were worse uh, internationally in more unequal societies were also worse in more unequal American states. The picture is, is very, very similar. Um, here you've got um, uh, one of a number of, uh, of analyses of uh, bullying in schools. This is the percentage of 11 year olds who bullied others two or more times in, in the, uh, over some months, I can't remember how many, but you see um, it goes from two or 3% um, in the more equal countries up to something like 10 times that level. Um, and anyone who's looked at the long-term effects of bullying knows that it casts a, what we call a, a long shadow forwards, affecting the development of a child's personality and so on. It's, it's quite traumatic to be bullied um, uh, substantially uh, at school. Um, many people imagine that inequality is justified um, if uh, it produces initiative, um, uh, spurs action, creativity, and so on. Uh, this analysis is um, uh, from um, someone in, in uh, South Korea, um, Gangkuk Lee, and uh, it looks at patents per head of population. So how many people are inventing things that they then take out a patent on. So uh, it's some measure of creativity. And you see the familiar pattern, more unequal countries doing worse. Um, the other uh, 
idea people use to justify high inequality is the idea that if people can find their right level in society, that somehow it's fair. You know, the idea that if you work hard, you move up, um, uh, and if you're lazy and don't work hard, you move down, and that it's justified, um, the, the big differences in income. Um, and yet, uh, our first analysis of this relationship on a smaller number of countries, and then this uh, um, uh, bigger analysis from the Brookings Institute in Washington, shows that there is less social mobility in more unequal countries. Uh, the measure of social mobility is, is really income-related mobility. So it's asking, do rich fathers have rich sons and poor fathers have poor sons? Uh, they didn't look at mothers' and daughters' incomes because between the generations there have been such big changes in, in women's economic activity rates. But father's income is much more important in uh, more unequal societies. Your parents' background and so on determines uh, where you go in society more strongly in a more unequal society. Um, one, I want now to show you what I think is one of the most fundamental effects of inequality. Uh, so. The next few slides are, uh, are really to um, different ways of expressing the same picture of the divisiveness, the social divisiveness of inequality. And of course, the people ever since the, I don't know, the French Revolution or perhaps even earlier, have often had an intuition that inequality is divisive and, and perhaps socially corrosive. Um, and basically measures the number of studies now showing that measures of people's involvement in community life, the strength of community life, measures of social cohesion, show that uh, societies are more public spirited. People are more involved in each other, with each other locally in more equal countries, um, that inequality is divisive. Um, and then, uh, you see that in more unequal countries, people also trust each other less. Um, the measure of trust here is whether people agree uh, that most people can be trusted. When we looked at the American states, we used a, a question from the uh, federal government's general social survey, and it, it asked, uh, do you think people, other people would take advantage of you if they got the chance? So that was the, their measure of trust. And both of them show almost exactly the same relationship with inequality. Inequality declines very substantially uh, with inequality. So you see it goes from less than 20% feeling they can trust others to 60, 70%, something like that. Uh, Imagine, though, if you're particularly think of, of women walking home alone, perhaps in a, um, uh, a, a major, a big city, uh, you'd feel very much safer doing this um, walking, well, men and women walking home alone in um, uh, a more equal society. Um, in the more unequal ones, you have to be aware of who, who's on the street around you. Um, uh, there is that slight fear all the time um, and need to be careful. Uh, the other thing that uh, is very well established is that homicide rates are higher in more unequal uh, societies. Uh, these red dots are American states. Um, and the blue triangles are Canadian provinces. Um, and you see enormous differences. Uh, it goes from about, I suppose, 15 homicides per million amongst those blue triangles up to 150 um, in, in the American states. Uh, it's 
the reason why this uh, relationship exists and it's been showing shown so many times around the world in peer-reviewed journals is that um, violence is so often triggered by loss of face humiliation people feeling disrespected and put down you know there's one way i can make you respect me uh, so often it's a it's to do with pride and shame. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, what inequality does is it makes status and class more, imp um, more important. If you look at really much more unequal countries than the ones in our analysis, um, I took this photograph in, in Mexico um, where we were invited to give some lectures. You see that uh, there are there's much higher levels of inequality. People are frightened of each other. They barricade themselves with these fences and the wire on um, barriers on the windows and doors. And you see just the same thing in, in South Africa, um, where, uh, uh, again, uh, well, this notice, you can't really see it clearly, but it says armed response meaning you might get shot if you're caught climbing in. And these wires across the top are electric wires. Um, uh, and you can just see some great big dogs there who uh, will presumably uh, give you a hard time if you are caught climbing in. Um, so you move from societies with low levels of inequality and strong community life, a sense that people trust each other, to these societies where people are frightened of each other. And that picture is consistent right across the slides I've been, the few, last few slides I've been showing you of the breakdown in community relations, the breakdown in trust, the rise in violence, um, and so on. Um, what I think um, really confirms that picture I've been telling you is this graph from two American economists. They looked at the proportion of uh, the national labor force uh, doing what they called guard labor. That means jobs like uh, security staff, uh, police, uh, prison officers, uh, people like that. Basically all the people we use to protect ourselves from each other that sector becomes bigger and more important in more unequal societies um, uh, because it's uh, uh, um, this breakdown, basically breakdown in social relations. Uh, uh, they too repeated their analysis on the 50 American states and found much the same picture. Now, I think what I'm telling you about is uh, not something that's different from the pattern that we've always recognized, uh, that outcomes tend to be poorer in the poorest areas of our society. I'm sure in, in Cairo that um, literacy levels and health and so on are worst in the poorest areas, uh, just as they are in, in British city, cities. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, what we're seeing is really telling us more about that pattern. And I think basically uh, what the material differences, the income differences between us are doing, are uh, increasing the social distances. If you like, bigger material differences between us uh, create the bigger social distances, those feelings of superiority and inferiority in a society. So I, I suspect what we're really dealing with is whether we live in a society with a very steep social hierarchy uh, like this or a much shallower one like that. And that really changes social relationships and uh, how we see each other. Um, I think uh, people very widely are embarrassed by class differences and uh, there's, a, there's a sense of awkwardness around them. And what, what inequality does is it makes, it strengthens the power of, of class and status. Uh, it's hold over our lives. 
um, and also things like uh, the chances of upward social mobility or whatever. I'm going now to tell you what I think is one of the fundamental bases of these effects uh, that we came across doing research on the very big health inequalities, the social class differences in health within our societies, you know, the tendency for life expectancy to be uh, longer amongst the rich than the poor. Um, we always initially thought that those differences were due to differences in material living conditions, um, living standards. Uh, but rather to our surprise, um, it became clear that there were powerful psychosocial effects um, working through chronic stress, um, uh, making us more vulnerable to all sorts of uh, diseases, uh, of late, particularly diseases of later life associated with, with aging. You know, the effects of chronic stress look rather like more rapid aging. You get older faster if you're very stressed. Um, and what we saw in the epidemiology was that uh, large social status differences are bad for population health. Uh, low social status is bad for individuals' health. Um, but on the other hand, in contrast to that, friendship is highly protective. Uh, whether you are well integrated socially with lots of friends involved in community life and so on, is not only a powerful determinant of happiness, it's also a powerful determinant of health, whether you measure it uh, just by self-reports or by death rates. Um, uh, uh, and the effect of friendship uh, in meta-analysis looked as if it was uh, at least as powerful as whether or not you smoke. Good social relations uh, are, are really beneficial to health. I think because the people with good social relations, they're more relaxed with other people. Uh, those, that sense of awkwardness, those worries about how you're seen and judged uh, are less amongst friends. Uh, than, you know, if you're thinking about your position, your, your worth in relation to other people, the idea that uh, uh, your worries about whether they think you're unimportant and stupid and unattractive and boring and all those, though, you know, that is one of the most important sources of chronic stress at the population level. And of course, an individual can have worse stress if they uh, child is imprisoned or they lose a home or something like that. But the sort of stresses I'm talking about are population wide. Almost everyone feels them. Uh, and that, I think, gives rise to this remarkable contrast between the health effects of social status as damaging and uh, a friendship as uh, um, a very protective of health. Um, so I think what's happening is basically, uh, sorry, I haven't quite finished with this. What we're talking about, I think, is, is that access to the basic necessities of life, food and clothing and so on, uh, if it's a matter of competition, if uh, I, I live in a society where I have to get, grab what I can, um, and feel that uh, other people uh, are my rivals, um, then that's a more difficult relationship than if I'm in a, a, a society where there are good social bonds, public spirited, um, good friendship groups and so on, um, where we feel that relationships are based on reciprocity, on mutuality, we recognize each other's needs. Um, and indeed, the gift uh, is um, a, a, a nice expression of, of mutuality. It says in a very concrete terms, uh, I recognize your need. Um, the, the gift is a symbol of recognition of, of the other's need and that I'm not going to fight you for access to things. So social relationships throughout human evolution have always been uh, crucial to well-being, and and we continue to have that extraordinary sensitivity that 
we pick up in the epidemiology. Uh, and indeed, it's built into the language. You find uh, words like companion in different European languages, I, uh, I expect in uh, Arabic languages as well. And there are, um, uh, it, they combine con and pan. Um, uh, your companions are the people you share necessities with, um, actually written into the language uh, in that way. And it was this anthropologist, Marshall Salins, who studied hunting and gathering societies, uh, the prehistoric hunting and gathering societies all, all his life, that are based on, on food sharing and gift exchange and so on. He he talked about gifts making a sort of social bond between people and the sense uh, uh, the need to reciprocate, which confirms that social bond. Said gifts make friends and friends make gifts. So I think this is why issues to do with inequality, uh, whether we are helping each other out, sharing or not, uh, or uh, each other's rivals, are so important. Um, you see the differences in stress uh, between more and less equal societies. Note on this slide, instead of having income inequality along the bottom, you've got deciles of the income distribution. So the poorest tenth of the population in different countries is on the left, and the richest tenth is on the right. Uh, up the side, you've got a measure of, of status anxiety. Your worries about how you're seen and judged, basically by other people. And you see that top line shows higher levels of status anxiety across all income groups in more unequal societies. The bottom line shows much lower levels um, of status anxiety in the more e equal, the low inequality countries. Um, and although as you would expect, uh, status anxiety is higher amongst the poor than the rich, uh, you can also see this very big effect of, of inequality um, uh, in societies at large. We know that the kinds of stress that push up our biological levels of stress hormones, principally cortisol, which you can measure in, in saliva or in, in blood, um, is particularly sensitive to these worries about how you're seen and judged. Um, in a meta-analysis of over 200 sub studies uh, where they exposed people to different stressors um, and uh, uh, measured the stress responses, they found that uh, what pushed up our levels of, of stress hormones were tasks which included what they call social evaluative threat. That is your worries about how you're seen and judged by others. Threats to self-esteem or social status where others can negatively judge your performance. That's, that what, that's what really gets to us. We're particularly sensitive to it. And actually that leads into uh, what actually was our second uh, book together, Kate Pickett and I, on the effects of inequality on, on mental illness, the psychological effects. Um, and... Uh, 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 some WHO data um, showed us that mental illnesses were more common in more unequal countries, but there's now been a, a much bigger and better study um, in, published in one of the BMJ, the British Medical Journal um, studies, um, uh, uh, journals, sorry. Uh, and this is showing you the correlation coefficient between measures of inequality and the frequency of different, uh, the, the 10 most common um, mental disorders. And you see uh, a lot of them, it's a 0.4 or even 0.5 correlation between inequality and uh, the frequency of these conditions. Uh, slightly the other way around, but I don't think significantly for suicide and alcohol. We also know how these um, uh, sort of uh, these issues to do with inequality get into uh, to provoke or exacerbate mental illnesses. Uh, a, a big study by Sherry Johnson and um, 
uh, colleagues of hers um, at uh, Berkeley in California found a, a wide range of mental illnesses and personality disorders are exacerbated um, and, uh, um, or triggered uh, by issues to do with subordination or, or submissiveness, the a desire to, or the desire to avoid subordination. You might feel that everyone's trying to put you down and you constantly have to fight it. Um, or you may, on the other hand, become very narcissistic and just assume you're better than everyone else. Um, uh, so they looked at both sides of that. So I think it, it's, those are some of the connections that account for these correlations. Um, but basically, we see two major responses to great inequality where um, people become more worried about what others think of them. Um, there's this response where you decide everyone's better than you, you're not good enough, um, you're boring, you're unattractive, people think you're stupid and so on, where you find social relationships very, uh, very stressful and you try and avoid uh, social contact. You don't go out in the evening to see friends. Um, uh, so that is, is one uh, common response where you sort of go under, you accept your inferiority and, and so on. But the, uh, and we certainly see that um, depression goes up in more unequal, these are American states. There are about three studies showing more depression in more unequal societies. But the other response is the opposite of that. If you're worried about how people, um, what people think of you, uh, you may become very narcissistic, find ways of uh, basically of, of um, making yourself look good in other people's eyes. Um, and that sort of narcissism seems to go up in more unequal societies. Um, there are now studies of what's called self-enhancement. Um, in this study, uh, a team of psychologists asked people in these countries, how do you think you can pair with the average in your country. Do you think you're cleverer than other people? Do you think you're more generous? Uh, you know, they asked them to, to rate themselves. Rather like the, I don't know whether you've heard a joke about, I think 96% of Americans say they're better drivers than average. Um, it's a bit like that, but basically, um, uh, people in more unequal societies big themselves up. Uh, this uh, self-aggrandizement, um, this tendency to uh, self-importance and so on. Um, some studies of individual conditions um, and drug use and so on. Um, the very obvious way in which we big ourselves up in others' eyes is through um, conspicuous consumption wearing uh, expensive looking clothes or uh, driving a, a, an expensive upmarket car. Um, you know, all, all sorts of ways people signal their um, position in, in these terms. And there are now studies that show that in more unequal areas, um, people spend more on uh, status goods. Um, and indeed, you see that with, as inequality goes up, people borrow more, get into debt more in order to finance these sort, the sort of expenditure to keep up with the people above them. Uh, so all that kind of thing. Um, I think I must uh, uh, bring this uh, to a close, but I just say a few words about what I think we can do. Basically, there are two different, um, quite different ways of reducing income differences. On the right, um, uh, by more progressive income taxes, um, more generous social security systems, redistribution. But on the left, you see, uh, we need to make uh, income differences smaller before tax, the differences in market income smaller. Um, and uh, uh, that seems to be possible through a number of uh, uh, different avenues, uh, stronger trade unions. There's quite a strong relationship between 
trade union strength and over time and uh, uh, cross-sectionally uh, and inequality. Um, uh, I, I think that we have to introduce measures of uh, company democracy, employee representation, employee ownership uh, as one way of moderating the differences in, in incomes between CEOs at the top and the, um, uh, the manual workers. Um, it also looks as if it helps if you have a system that, well, like the Japanese had of promoting company directors from within companies instead of bringing in a financial elite and a, a, um, parachuted in to direct companies you promote people from within the company who have loyalties to other colleagues and so on so a number of ways i think you can uh, reduce income differences before tax but we also need to reduce uh, 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 to redistribute the, the history um, of inequality shows, I think, the, the growth and then the weakening of the whole labor movement, the ideal of socialism, um, you know, as it strengthened, income differences got smaller. Uh, Roosevelt uh, introducing the New, New Deal in the 1930s. Uh, explained it to the rich elite by saying we have to redistribute uh, 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 we have to reform in order to preserve they were afraid that uh, 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 at that time that people would perhaps think the great depression the joblessness the huge unemployment would be taken as the collapse of the uh, uh, capitalist system that Marxism had predicted. Uh, and so I think there was real fear, um, which led to, if you like, a humanization of society, the development of welfare states. That all disappeared in the late 1970s and early 80s, and you get that modern rise of inequality. Um, I, I'm sorry not to have uh, Egypt here. I know that quite a lot of uh, 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 much, many more societies have this basic pattern, uh, a U-shaped pattern throughout the 20th century um, in income inequality. Um, yeah, that's that's. This is the graph I mentioned that I've seen now for a number of countries showing uh, the top line is that that U-shaped um, pattern of inequality in uh, the United States. The bottom line is the proportion of uh, the um, workforce in trade unions. And you see that one is a mirror image of the other. Um, I think now I should, uh, should stop. Um, so I, my main emphasis, I think, would, in the long term would be uh, all forms of economic democracy. Uh, you know, the multinational companies uh, they're extraordinarily powerful, undemocratic organizations. And in a way, uh, part of the raison d'etre, I suppose, is to concentrate in income at the top. Um, and we don't need that. We do need what they produce, um, but we don't need those, uh, uh, that huge input in, into inequality. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I look forward to questions. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. However, I will ask uh, our attendees, uh, please uh, write, if you have a question or a comment, please raise your hand or write it uh, in a comment section. And then we will ask you by name to unmute yourself and to ask yourself uh, the question. But let me tell you do this. Let me start by uh, by asking a few questions uh, from Professor Wilkinson. Okay, uh, let me start by from what can be done, because I don't think we had enough time to cover this area. We talked more about the impact of the problem rather than the solution. I think it needs like separate session itself. Uh, 
But from here, I would like really to start because I was visualizing in a country like Egypt, where we have like a huge gap and it might take tens of years to, to solve or to find even a proper solution to tackle such an issue, which is a gap because less than 15% of population are controlling most of the resources of the country. So when it comes to income inequality, it's really hard to minimize this gap. So here, let's tackle it from a psychological, um, societal gap. Can we reducing, I know it's horrible what I'm going to say, by making stereotyping or raising the acceptance of this gap, because we see in the old movies, in, in Egyptian movies, you know, it was positioning the poor family like it's not so bad. You know, they just chose to live to live a simple life, a humble life, to have a cottage in, a, in an amazing calm place. So they made it look and sound like it's a choice. At this time, all those impacts you talked with numbers, I'm talking about as just an observation. At this years or long ago, all those uh, criteria and impacts you talked about, it was a little bit less. The homicide, the suicide, the, the depression, it was less. People were, were a little bit happier and accepting. So do you think you know, it might be like a good transition for a country like Egypt or any other much more poorer country with a huger gap? It might be like a temporary solution for to, to, to avoid stereotyping, to make them feel respected, and to uplift a little bit the basic necessities, as you call it in your presentation, because what I saw in your pyramid, both were eight levels. It's just about the slope. Here also, it, it put a question mark in my head. You didn't like dissolve levels. You know, you, you, this pyramid was with eight levels and this pyramid was with eight levels. I counted it. So it's all about the slope of, of the pyramid, not about the levels itself. I'll stop here. <laughs> I think the number of levels is is just chance. I took the same graph, uh, the same diagram uh, off the web, and I just stretched one out, you know, by pulling the corners out. So that's why they have the same number. Uh, you shouldn't read anything into that of what my understanding of the issue. Um, uh, I, I don't deal more with um, what we can do because I'm uh, an epidemiologist. I'm not an economist. Um, I can tell economists, you must find a way of reducing income differences. But I don't think it's my job really to tell them how. Um, I, I have been forced into making some suggestions of the kind I made uh, today. Um, uh, in relation to one thing you were saying uh, earlier, I think that uh, in more unequal countries, you get steeper social gradients, supposing you're looking at literacy or something, and of course it's, it's lower amongst poor children. Um, but if you then look at a more equal country, you see the higher levels of uh, literacy right across the board. Um, it makes most difference amongst the poor, the gradient becomes less steep, but even uh, better off children do a little bit better in more equal countries. Um, so basically you have a social gradient like that, or a much steeper and lower one like that. Um, I, I'm not really answering your question. Um, can you... Put, put to me again the part, any part you think I should be able to answer as an epidemiologist. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry, the, one more point I should have made. It, 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 although some of this data is not available on a comparable basis, you know, you can't get similar measures of mental illness or um, teenage births or whatever that we looked at. Um, uh, but you can get measures of life expectancy, you can usually get measures of homicide rates and things like that, which can be compared. And we find basically the same processes are going on uh, in poorer societies. Um, but uh, you do have to control for GNP per capita because uh, uh, amongst the uh, 
less well-off countries, that also makes a difference. Um, in the rich world, it doesn't. You find that uh, um, once you get as rich as any of those countries there, getting richer doesn't reduce these kinds of problems. Okay, thank you so much for this. I think we will uh, we will move to uh, to the next question because it's very long. We have a question from uh, Ro uh, Roland uh, Bardi. Please unmute yourself and ask the question um, if you would love. If not, I can read it. But I think it's better that you um, address it yourself. Roland, well, thank you. Um, I, I I I I am unmuted. Well. Um, thank you, Professor Wilkinson. My point is what you showed was Gini, the index of income equality, being the cause of other inequalities. And, but in your introduction, you said there is a wide range of No, can I correct you at that, this point? I wasn't showing that income inequality led to other forms of inequality. I was saying that the whole society does worse where there is more income inequality. Okay, yes, and, and you showed some uh, characteristics of those, uh, those uh, conditions. But my question was going to the, the way it, income inequality is what we talk about, but isn't it that in some places like, let me take India or Sub-Saharan Africa, which I know a little better than India, inequality is, caused by the culture and the dinner just said there are people who accept this because it's the status in which they are used to live and they accept it because they live well with that inequality so income is one thing and culture is the other thing that's my point or my question thank you i've been reviewing or reading two books on the history of inequality uh, just recently, uh, one by Thomas Piketty and the other by Wiseman. And uh, there seems to be now quite a clear understanding that the main determinant of inequality is ideology. Um, so we're dealing with, with, with culture with that. And of course, why people see themselves, uh, well, as you say, maybe accept their condition, is they start to believe their inferiority. Uh, that is part of the cost of inequality. Um, people, um, I, I, I've met so many people who think that they are unskilled manual workers because they are, they would imagine genetically stupid. And actually the, the whole program of, of intelligence and genetics seems to me to be a failed research programs, program now. Um, there've always been ideologies to justify inequality, uh, ideas that, you know, slaves had souls that were made of iron and um, the, the elite had souls made of gold and, you know, all sorts of rubbish. And it continues uh, now and, and is, is a very powerful justifier of inequality. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and basically the... the ideologies that um, contribute to inequality uh, contain those sorts of ideas, make people at the top believe that they are superior to other people, not just because they've been brought up in richer households and, and better educated, um, but they think there's something, uh, something more fundamental, more biological that's given rise to those differences. Um, but as I said, in the more equal countries, fathers' uh, parents' income is less important in determining childhood outcomes um, where, where children end up. Um, so uh, I, I disagree with the premise of your question. Okay, thank you. But you said ideology is a determinant. 
And that would give an answer to Dinah Omer's question, how to fight. Oh, yes. So we uh, fight uh, ideologies. Yeah. Yes. And um, uh, that's, I think, what some of my, uh, sorry, I'm losing the thread, some of my graphs are, are showing. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me see. Um, the, the relationship between trade union strength that I showed you. Um, I don't know how else you can explain that. I don't think it's, it's simply that trade unions win huge pay awards for their uh, workers. I think that trade union strength is, a, is an indicator of the sort of um, um, countervailing voice in society the proportion of the population who believe there is another way of that society can work that is better for all of us and uh, for uh, a good part of the uh, 20th century that idea was strengthening but from the 1970s or 80s onwards that idea really disappeared um, uh, uh, and well our, our Prime Minister then, uh, Tony Blair, um, I think he, he really imagined that inequality didn't matter anymore because people were no longer starving. Um, people were no longer living in terrible conditions, uh, or at least only a, a tiny proportion of the population. But what he didn't see was that there are these psychological effects on the functioning of the society, the quality of social relations that have so many other consequences. Uh, so he was wrong to think that inequality didn't matter. Um, it's not just the material differences, uh, it's the psychological effects of those differences. Uh, okay, we still have like three questions. I know we're running out of time. Uh, please, Lauren Clark, Clark uh, ask your question, but quickly, please, because we still have a couple of questions also. Lauren? Hi. Lauren Clark, please. Yes. Lauren? You're muted. Yes, I'm here. Yes. I'm here. Good. Hi, Dr. Richard. Um, it's a pleasure um, to meet you. Um, my you. question relates to the role of gender and the role yes. of women in various nations. So in your research, have you found studies on how women's ability to effectively distribute resources significantly, significantly impact socioeconomic growth for a nation? Um, I think there are studies of that kind. Um, I don't know them well because uh, I have concentrated very much on, on developing the, uh, the research I've been showing you, but gender inequality is closely related to these overall uh, income differences that I've been showing you. In the societies where uh, the income differences are bigger in the population as a whole, women's disadvantage increases, uh, the pay differential increases, uh, the differences in education increase, um, women's political participation is poorer in those more unequal countries. Um, and I, 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 the same, I think, goes for ethnic differences. And I think that what happens if you get a hierarchical society where everything is based on, on, on superiority or, uh, if you like, greater strength, I and mean, I do think there are connections with uh, uh, our, our evolutionary past, you know, to understand these issues, I think you have to understand monkey hierarchies rather than necessarily Marx. Um, what happens is that anything that becomes a marker of weakness or low social status uh, is taken advantage of. So 
if your skin color or your language group or your um, religious affiliation marks you out as a group with a lower social status, you will be subjected to discrimination, stigmatization, and so on. Okay. Um, and people always talk about the problem of being, you know, whether there are more or less of one ethnic group at the bottom and with more unemployment or women suffering more. Um, but these problems are not solved by having equal numbers of men and women treated badly and stigmatized um, and on lower incomes, we have to reduce the dif differentials themselves. So nobody is disrespected and looked down on and exploited in that sort of way. So I think that these other aspects of inequality are not separate aspects. I think they're quite intimately connected. Does that make sense to you? Okay, uh, thank you, Professor, and thank you, Lauren. I think we move to the next question from Mariam Abu Zid. Mariam, please, uh, uh, Vinit Sharma, I think your question is coming, but uh, let's start with Mariam because she's uh, asked first. Mariam, please uh, unmute yourself. Hi, I. I uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask a question about taxation and inequality because that's something we see a lot and how some taxes actually turn into regressive ones without countries noticing. And that's an issue I think that um, a country like Egypt would, would have to put a focus on because obviously you need revenues for the country, but at the same time, you need to be aware of the inequalities that are in your country to be able to deal with it. And on a second note, I just wanted to ask if this presentation would be available after. Uh, if, if, if I'm happy to share the slides, yes. Okay, thank you. But um, on the taxation issue, uh, I know very little about taxation, but uh, uh, taxation, when inequality went down, taxation was very high, top tax rates. This is uh, American data, but it's very like the British data. Uh, so the richest people were paying uh, most of the, the top bit of their income in tax um, in the, uh, well, right through until the 60s and 70s. Um, and interestingly, uh, where's that slide? Um, yes, this is a slide that shows the changing differential incomes within a, com uh, within a company. So this is looking at the biggest 350 companies in the United States. And this is uh, showing the uh, income differences between the CEO at the top and the average production worker. Um, and you see around 1975, 80, uh, they were getting 30 or 40 times as much at the, at the top as the average production worker. But then, uh, as I said, these income differences took off um, uh, as trade union strength and the loss of the ideology uh, that there was another way of running society. As all that collapsed, um, you get governments come in who privatized public utilities, who lowered top tax rates, and these huge differentials opening up. So CEOs were earning two, three, or 400 times as much as production workers. Thank you. OK, uh, Professor, can we take uh, one more question? Yes, please. Actually, we have more than one more question. OK, uh, Vinit Sharma, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correct. Uh, please ask your question. And then have yes, one in Marakbi. Yeah. Yes, it was a wonderful uh, presentation, uh, Professor. So my basic question is regarding the, you know, the role that the new technologies are playing, for example, blockchain, which basically, you know, uh, has, helps, you know, billionaires in, you know, uh, I mean, in, you know, hiding taxes and all, you know, 
and their, not only taxes, even their wealth also, you know, blockchain, chain, cryptocurrency, and even the innovation, for example, in gaming, you know, etc. you know, for example, even these, you know, billionaires, uh, 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 in, you know, I mean, uh, innovating to go into space, etc. So it's not that, that that also responsible, the technology today of today is not being, you know, used for common men, but is more used to, you know, to, to serve the elites, you know, to uh, serve the uh, to top end. And that is also one of the reasons for, uh, you know, this wealth in quality and other th other point i wanted to make the rising globalization and the uh, you know which is basic, uh, basically creating a lot more you know uh, i mean uh, premium for you know capital you know as compared to labor so for example in, in case of the inflation rises by say by, by 10 percent you, you know can you go a little bit slower on your second question yeah, as far as, you know, for example, the inflation, as far as is concerned, you know, it goes, grows by 10%. But because the, you know, the technology, because everything is, you know, is so going towards automation, we are going through, you know, uh, cloud uh, robotics, etc. You know, the, as the wages are basically not being rising uh, as fast as uh, compared to capital, you know, and the capital is much more, you know, uh, diverted towards uh, uh, stock market uh, bubbles, asset bubbles, etc. So uh, uh, can I have your views over that, you know? Thanks very much. Well, you're talking about areas that I feel I'm not an expert on. Um, I worry a lot about um, uh, these uh, new um, digital currencies and the, the dark web. Um, they seem to me an invitation to corruption, the ability to keep it all secret, and uh, uh, it becomes very hard for governments to exercise any control. So I worry about it but I don't know about it. I, I really don't know how they work. Um, your other point, um, can you remind me, Dina? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For example, the government policies, you know, which are creating further wage inequality. For example, the inflation that is rising by say 10% or 15%. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, the, the only point I'd say on that is that, um, uh, Thomas Piketty, who is an expert on those things, uh, and although he pointed out that uh, um, returns to capital grew faster than the, the, the general economy, and so he thought that was a, a permanent engine driving increases in inequality, uh, he too says that the real controlling factor in inequality is ideology. In his new book, he makes that point quite strongly. Uh, and people who've uh, written about the history of inequality see the changes coming out of crises where the established ideology takes a major knock. Um, uh, something that, uh, well, like um, the depression in the 1930s or some political upheaval, um, it's events of that kind, people say, lead to reductions in inequality um, and uh, often an upward trend in between those times, uh, presumably driven by um, the processes that uh, Thomas Piketty outlined. Thank you so much. Uh, I think now is Hassan El Marakbi. Please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Good evening, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you first for your insightful presentation. Uh, my question quickly, uh, as you mentioned in your presentation that the income in, uh, inequality in, um, in, the, in the countries these days, it's not leading to the other inequalities, but when you see a country with a high income inequality, it comes to, like as a result others, but it's not a lead. Uh, my question here is that uh, some countries, they start to work on the uh, other inequalities separately and in this uh, in this thing uh, like a country like Kazakhstan comes to my mind which is a country with a very high income inequality but at this at the moment after like I just saw like uh, an article about uh, them maybe last week they become very low in health inequality like they are almost close to the equality form so I want to ask you a point of view about that do you think like countries especially the low and middle income countries, 
it will be easier for them to start to work separately on the other inequalities rather than working on raising the social welfare of the uh, citizens generally, which may be take longer time, which may be take uh, more resources. Uh, so I was just want uh, your point of view about that. So working yeah. separately on inequalities or the raise of the social welfare of the citizen of the country is the only way to get better results on the long run. Thank you. Well, uh, when you said working on other inequalities, did you mean gender and ethnicity or what? No, I mean like, uh, for example, in, uh, in, in Kazakhstan, they are working on making their health care system better until they reach a very low uh, degree of health inequality. So rich people and poor people are getting the same, uh, the same uh, health, uh, health uh, resources. Yes. And this article, they was talking mainly about the under five mortality. So rich kids and poor kids are almost treated the same, although they are having a high income inequality. Okay. Um, well, first I would worry about the quality of the data. Um, uh, epidemiologists have shown over and over again uh, in really good studies uh, all over the world that medical care, although it's important, it is not the most important determinant of health. Uh, what matters is the conditions in which you live and are exposed to. Um, medical care may make a difference to your survival rates once you've got some disease, um, but overwhelmingly more important is whether you get that disease to begin with um, and how well you recover. Uh, I once did a study looking at um, survival from different conditions in different social classes amongst people who were receiving exactly the same medical care and poorer people are more likely to die of a cancer once they've got it, even when you control for the stage of the cancer. They're more likely to die after a heart attack, even if they're getting the same medical treatment. Um, and of course, they are much more likely uh, to get those uh, conditions to begin with. Um, my background, as I mentioned, is, was in studying health inequalities, um, admittedly within rich societies. Um, but one of the most famous studies, and if you listen to um, Michael Marmot's um, <clears throat> uh, talk in this series earlier, um, one of the studies he's worked on is a study of 17,000, well, two studies, of one of 17,000 civil servants, uh, nearly all office workers, um, and the other 13,000 of them followed up over time. And the first study found differences in heart disease amongst people working in the same government offices. Uh, the more junior people had three times as much heart disease death rates were three times as high. Uh, so when you tell me that uh, the socioeconomic differences, the income differences uh, have remained the same and somehow they've uh, got rid of the health inequalities that we always see as the result, I find it, you know, I need to look at the figures and see how they are connected and uh, all that kind of thing. Um, before I could really th think what on earth is happening that makes that society so different from all the rest of the, the studies we've seen around the world. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Clear. Thank you so much, Professor Richard Wilkinson. And I think it was so generous from you. We exceeded the time. I have just one more comment, if you allow me. Yes, of course. It won't take much time. It's about the school bullying uh, study that and the results that you shared with us. Because for me, it was a little bit surprising that children at the age of eleven, I think the study at, was at the age of uh, eleven, to start feel the the income inequalities. I believe that they can still uh, feel the poverty, but the study it was about the different rates of bullying in income 
different uh, income inequalities countries. So if you can elaborate more in how, how it was conducted, or if, if there is no time, if you can share no, with no, us I'm like details about, about the study. It. Yes. Okay. You see that, um, firstly, I should say there have been several studies showing those powerful effects on, on school bullying. Uh, secondly, remember that bullying is a hierarchical relationship. It's a relationship, it's about showing that you are better than the other kids. Um, uh, and any weakness in other kids is exploited. It's very like a monkey hierarchy, um, where the dominants are stronger and the ones at the bottom are weaker. Um, and the whole, uh, uh, the, the rank ordering of the monkeys is held together by fear. Um, <clears throat> so think of that. Uh, <clears throat> analogy. Um, and that's why I say you need to understand monkeys more than Marx to understand the effects of inequality. Um, but uh, there was a second point I wanted to make um, about that. Yes, you see, I don't know if you're aware of the field of epigenetics, uh, ways in which your environment, including your social environment, can switch genes on and off. They don't change your genetic uh, uh, code um, and they don't alter it um, uh, except to it make some genes inactive. So uh, they change gene expression. Um, and uh, there's now a lot of evidence um, that position in social hierarchy, for instance, can switch genes on and off. Because, and what it's basically about is that if you're growing up in, in a kind of society where bullying is, uh, and hierarchy is very important, you need different social strategies from one's societies which are based on uh, a lot of sharing and trust. Um, and uh, a young child, uh, I suspect has to be programmed. So, you know, is it growing up in a world where it was, has to fight for what it can get, learn not to trust others because we're all rivals, or is that child growing up in a society where it, it will depend on cooperation, on trust, on reciprocity? Uh, those are quite different uh, require quite different cognitive and emotional strategies. Um, and uh, it looks as if uh, epigenetic switches are behind that process. And I suspect they contribute to the bullying, um, uh, bull bullying behavior. Uh, I, I remember an awful newspaper uh, cutting, which it was reporting on a legal case in which um, it was a British case, um, a mother and grandmother of a child, of, 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 of I think two children, had been making the children fight at the age of three and four. Um, so a little boy and little girl were being taught to hit each other. Um, and they were taken to court for cruelty and neglect. And uh, they said in their defense that it was important to toughen the children, toughen the children up. That is how they saw the society they were in. You have to be tough to survive. And so I think that and the sort of epigenetic things I was talking about feed into uh, that relationship between bullying and inequality. Thank you so much. I think we came up to the end of our session today. Actually, they are asking me to, to ask you, please, to stop sharing the slides because they are going to share another one. Thank you so much, Professor. It was a very enlightening session. And honestly, I mean, I would love to have like another session with your kind self once more. You know, maybe John Gerhardt can help us to have this. It was really a pleasure having you for the past one hour and more. Thank you so much. And looking Thank forward you for to meet you. Me. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you all. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see, sorry, the, the coming title. Just a second. Sorry, I had a technical problem. Thank you so much. And, um, and let me introduce the session of um, John Gerhardt Center for the coming, uh, for the coming week. It's uh, Financing a Just a Transition to Net Zero by Nick Robbins. Uh, thank you so much for your attendance and looking forward to have you in other sessions uh, introduced by John Gerhardt Center from the American University in Cairo. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Um, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. Professor Wilkinson, it was really uh, an eye opener, and I really thank you for it. Uh, it's very easy to do. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Stay safe, and I, 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 I'm sure we're going to cross paths again in the future. Okay. Um, don't leave it too long. I'm getting old. <laughs> I know, sir. I know, sir. But it was fantastic. It was much better than uh, what uh, being a much younger person would have would have accomplished. I, okay. I thank you again. I thank, thank you again. for organizing it. Thank uh, you. Goodbye. Sir. I'll I'll share with you the link of the recording, and I would appreciate also if you can send send us the uh, the slides. We could share it if you don't mind with the participants. Yes. Thank you. I will do that. Good thing. Thank you then. Goodbye. Bye-bye.